recordings of this edition of the university webinar series to remind those of you who may not be aware this is our regular webinar series which happens on the first and the third fridays of every calendar month at 2 30 pm ist this afternoon we have dr ganapati who is a critical care physician from e road talking to us on critical care emergencies in rural areas critical care medicine to most of us is a specialty that is emerging but I would say critical care medicine is not a new speciality, but then an old speciality, which has been represented and made to realize the various responsibilities attached to the speciality. Over the times, the same speciality had been called as the intensive care medicine, the intensive medicine, trauma medicine, and so on. What really qualifies critical care medicine is a million dollar question. Critical care medicine would definitely encompass all the areas that I mentioned, emergency care, intensive care, even stress care. Highly stressed individuals in an intensive care setup would require the expert advice from the critical care specialist. It is a very touchy area. It's a very sensitive area. Probably an area that requires more and more of coordination as we learn more and more of the same area. And here we have Professor Dr. N. Ganapati, who had chosen to be a critical care physician in not as much an urban area like E Road and still make a very positive contribution to the needy society. Dr. Ganapati had been trained, as he calls himself, in the art and science of critical care medicine. He had been a practicing critical care physician since 1983. The national director of the Comprehensive Trauma Life Support International course. And through this course, he has trained more than 2000 service providers. He had been in the editorial panel of various journals, including the Indian Journal of Anesthesia and the Indian Journal of Toxicology. He is currently the advisor to the Journal International Trauma Care Indian Chapter, the international consulting editor for West Gem, California, and his research interests include management of snake bites and the effect of extracorporeal septic cartridges in snake bite and poisoning patients with sepsis and septic shock. Dr. Ganapati, with long years of experience in critical care, is here to talk to us on his experiences about critical care emergencies in rural areas. And the floor now is handed over to Dr. Ganapati with the panelists already on board. Dr. Ganapati, welcome. 
And Thank you, ma'am. We are very happy and honored that you would be participating in our university webinars. Welcome to each one of you who's already in here. And let's have a very, very fruitful afternoon. Thank you. And Dr. Ganapati, please. Thank you, ma'am. How to share the slide, madam? It's not opening. Ah, uh, so yes. You can. He can go to the slide share, yes, sir. sir. You can. You can open out the slide share. Our admin is making you the co-host now. Yes. Yeah. Yes. No, slide share is not active, ma'am. He can. We have activated you, sir. Sir, you are you are you are being made a co-host. Your your slide share is active from this side. It's been activated. What is your system, sir? Mac Macintosh, madam. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Macintosh. Maybe you would have to go into the system preferences and add up. Have you add up, sir? System preferences, and you will have to add up. We are on what? We are on Streamyard or? Uh, Maybe okay, ma'am. I'll, I'll just add up. I'll just. Yeah, you will have to go to your system preferences, privacy settings, and uh, screen recording. Once you open your system preferences, you will see privacy and settings amongst the various display. In yes, privacy and settings, please open that. You will find a, a long list. Keep moving down the list. You will find screen recording. And once you click screen recording on the right side, you will find what all uh, platforms are available. If you find Webex or Cisco Webex, please uh, click that. Maybe if there is a lock in your screen recording, then you'll have to put in your password and open the lock and only then Webex will become visible. Yeah, Webex I have activated. Open system. Yes, once you've activated Webex, now you can go back to your screen share. That is our screen. Now you go to your uh, this this uh, your screen where all of us are on display, no sir. That screen you will find that share link. Stop video. link share no And the share activate in the share will open up. Madam, I have gone into just a minute, madam. Uh, unlock. Okay. So I go to Cisco Webex, madam. Cisco Webex meeting I have gone in. Then what to yes. do, madam? I have unlocked and gone. System preferences of your system. Macintosh or system preferences or column. And the call at the system preferences let display la privacy and setting no narco. And the privacy and setting open panning and screen recording no nakato. And the screen recording la right side la zoom Cisco Webex and la la wonga get a downloaded or the nakato. Ada poi click panano. Ada click panamo the sila samaya enda pano. Kira wongloria lock here in the dran lock open panada the kudpen solo. Madam, I uh, again, madam, I open my system preferences then. Ah, system preferences, la, privacy and settings, no under go, sir. Privacy and settings. Yes, security and privacy. Ah, ah, ada open panda? Ada open panda? A panita, then on. Then ah, unlock. Then List over the Ama or there on the list in a kid upon a screen recording on her comarga. Paracama self color for the motto. In the same screen recording. I recommend, I'll click that. Okay, screen recording open panna, Valad Pacatla, and the and the Bapotilia Pacatler Grapotila, Cisco Webex Carter. The Amama, I'll unlock it. And I'll uh, unlock on it and the Cisco Webex tick for sir. Just a minute. 
கிளிக் பண்ணிட்டேன் என்ன சொல்றது அது ஷேர் வந்து ஆக்டிவேட்டே ஆகல எனவே அகைன் ரைட் ஓ ஸ்கிரீன் ரெக்கார்டிங் ஐ will go click lock இது ஹி ஹஸ் டு கோ அவுட் அண்ட் கம் பேக் சார் நீங்க ஒன்னு பாருங்க ஒரே ஒரு நிமிஷம் யூ ப்ளீஸ் லீவ் மீட்டிங் லீவ் மீட்டிங் அண்ட் ரீஜாயின் மீட்டிங் அண்ட் லீவ் பண்ணிடுங்க அந்த மீட்டிங்கை விட்டு வெளியில போய்ட்டு ரீஜாயின் பண்ணுங்க ஓகே 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 I thought he knew. Uh, I thought he knew. Otherwise, I would have asked him to screen share, check and check. You should have told me what I was going to do. Last time, we would have checked. This time, I thought he knew, so I just kept quiet. I was telling all this because you go and... No, that's because me and Selva were trying out every system last week and... Uh... Okay, man. Now you can share it. Sir, you can share it. Yes, that's it. Can you click on the share? Yes, yeah, click on the share. Click on the share. Cisco web meetings. Now, you can share it on your screen. You can share it on your desktop. Uh... Sir, you can share it on your screen. Okay, okay, okay. Share it. Yes, now you can. Yes, yes. Very good. Great. Yes, sir. Yes. We can see your presentation. Ipan inga avada, sir. Right, sir. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you, ma'am. So, good afternoon, everyone. I uh, respected Vice Chancellor, ma'am, and other ma'am from the university for giving me an opportunity. Uh, is it audible to everyone? A little louder. It's not it's a little louder, but then I think everyone is able to hear. No issues, yeah. sir. Okay, okay. Yes, yes. Please go on, sir. Yeah, sure. So critical care emergencies in rural area is a very vast topic. Today, I just wanted to insist on critical care toxicology where we encounter. I wish I always start my slide with the glory of medicine is constantly improving and there is always more to learn. Coming to the toxicological emergencies, previously we used to receive insecticides and pesticides like organophosphorus compound poisoning, organochloride group of poisoning and plant poisoning like oleander seed poisoning and so on. But nowadays we receive unique type of poisoning like yellow phosphorus, aluminum phosphate, hair dye poisoning and herbicide poisoning like paraquay. These are very severe poisoning with high mortality rate. I would like to go on with this poison. First coming to the yellow phosphorus poisoning which is a rodenticide which is consumed and the mortality rate is very high. I think in Madras you get from Virupuram more and it is available as ratol cake retal granules and retal paste. So this is the retal paste and we compare with the close-up paste. Most of the children take this as close-up paste and they die. You can go to the Google and if you browse you can see how many people are dying in this yellow phosphorus paste. So coming to the stages, it occurs in three stage. The first stage occurs within 24 hours and it is asymptomatic. The patient has got only local gastrointestinal irritation. In the second stage, which occurs between 24 to 72 hours after ingestion, the patient are asymptomatic and may be discharged prematurely. There may be mild elevation of liver enzyme and bilirubin at this state. But during the third stage, 
which occurs after 72 hours until the resolution of symptoms or death occurs. Hepatomegaly and jaundice appear. Acute fulminant hepatic failure occurs, mandating liver transplantation. Bleeding can occur due to coagulopathy and thrombocytopenia. Sometimes, patient may develop acute tubular necrosis and present with acute renal failure. Hemolysis can occur due to destruction of RBCs by phosphorus. The central nervous system, they get mental changes like confusion, psychosis, hallucinations and coma. And the cardiac toxicity includes hypotension, tachycardia, arrhythmias, toxic myocarditis and cardiogenic talk. How are we going to manage? We do not have any specific antidote. It is directed towards the removal of the poison and supportive therapy. Gastric leverage we give with potassium permanganate, which converts the phosphorus to relatively harmless toxic. Activated charcoal is used as 1 gram per kg body weight and multi-dose activated charcoal 0.5 gram per kg body weight every 6 hourly. Non-fatty purgatives like magnesium sulfate to eliminate the poison. We get more toxicity to charcoal and nowadays we adopt gastroscopic decontamination where we directly visualize the stomach and give stomach wash so that it is cleared. And coming to the management, we start with in acetyl cysteine even for acetaminophen poisoning and this retol poisoning and hemodialysis if renal failure develops. Therapeutic plasma exchange in acute renal failure. How are you going to give this n acetyl cysteine during immediate presentation or late presentation? The dose varies. During immediate presentation, we call it as 20 hours dose. We give a loading dose of 150 milligram per kg IV in 30 minutes and 50 milligram per kg IV in 4 hours, then 100 milligram per kg IV in 16 hours. When presented late more than 10 hours, a loading dose of 150 mg per kg IV in 1 hour and a maintenance dose of 70 mg per kg IV in 4 hours for at least 12 doses are given. Injection glutathione, a precursor of acetyl cysteine, is given 600 mg daily for 5 days and induction vitamin K for coagulopathy we give for 5 to 7 days. And finally, they go in for acute liver failure and it is defined by hepatic encephalopathy and loss of synthetic dysfunction within days to weeks of the first symptoms of liver disease. Hyperacute liver failure occurs between 0 to 7 days. Acute liver failure occurs between 8 to 28 days. Retal waste, 5% yellow phosphorus, produces hyperacute liver failure because the liver failure occurs between 0 to 7 days. And it has got a high mortality rate and it is due to acute metabolic disturbances, hepatic encephalopathy and severe coagulopathy. Up to 70% of liver necro necrosis, liver support system improves the survival because the liver has got an extensive regeneration capacity. Only if more than 90% of liver necrosis occurs, liver transplant is the choice. Following liver transplantation, the survival rate improves. Progressive hepatic synthetic and metabolic dysfunction leads to coagulopathy, jaundice, renal failure, worsening encephalopathy and metabolic dysfunction. So how are you going to support the liver? We have got two systems. One is therapeutic plasma exchange and other is liver dialysis or MARS. Uses of therapeutic plasma exchange in hepatic failure, it removes the plasma bound as well as heavy molecular weight toxin including ammonia, endotoxin, indoles, and mercatowns responsible for hepatic coma and hyperkinetic syndrome. It improves the cerebral blood flow, mean arterial pressure, cerebral perfusion pressure, cerebral metabolic rate, and increased hepatic blood flow. It also improvement in laboratory parameters they show, increase in the cholinesterase activity and galactase elimination capacity. It restores hemostasis by providing the coagulation factors and it removes activated clotting factors, tissue plasminogen activator, fibrin and fibrin degradation products. In recent series, TPE was shown to decrease the cytokine level, IL-2, 6, 8 and TNF-alpha, which are generally seen as an important 
or the systemic inflammatory state in these patients. That's what this uh, TPE is also used in COVID-19 cytosome. In some patients, the liver may recover during TPE and in other patients, failure may persist necessitating liver transplantation. Aggressive TPE has been used as a bridge to liver transplantation. How are you going to quantify the involvement of the liver? Lack of representation of a liver as a whole since most features are diffuse and coagulopathy due to liver biopsy increases the risk of bleeding. So these are all the limitations of liver biopsy. But nowadays we do quantification of the involvement of fat in the liver by MRI for which we should know the functional liver anatomy. The MRI fat quantification is classified as if below 6 quantification is that 5% of the cells are affected and it is grade 0 or normal. 16 to 14 fats are affected. 5 to 33% of the cells are affected and it is grade 1 or mild. If 15 to 20 segments are affected with the fat, 34 to 66% of the cells are affected and it is grade 2 or moderate and if it is grade severe more than 20 quantification are there and more than 67 percent of the cells are affected so this is for a patient who bad the fat quantification in each lobe is more than 20 so he is having grade 3 hepatic failure so that more than 67 percent of the liver cells are affected and here we can see the photos of the MRI on this is the normal liver echogenicity and here you can see the fatty liver where the fat has been deposited and this is grade 1 fatty liver that is only less than 5% of the cells are affected. Here you can see in grade 3 more than 67% of the cells are affected. You can compare the normal liver with grade 3 liver. So, already as already told, if less than 70% the liver cells are affected, the liver may regenerate during TPE or MARS. Failure may persist necessitating the liver transplantation. The supportive care here includes ICU admission, airway protection, hemodynamic stabilization, anti-encephalopathy measures and antibiotic. How do we do this therapeutic plasma exchange? The access is by central or peripheral vein with an anticoagulant of citrate. One to two plasma volume is exchanged with fresh frozen plasma with 5% albumin. Continuous vital parameters were monitored. Pre-procedure calcium levels are checked and intravenous calcium chloride given. The replacement fluid for the plasma may be either fresh frozen plasma or 5% albumin. Most studies in TPE for sepsis use fresh frozen plasma because it replaces the plasma clotting factors, no post pheresis coagulopathy, no immunoglobin deficiencies. Whereas in 5% albumin, immunoglobulins are lost with plasma pheresis when albumin used as a replacement fluid and immunoglobulins should be checked in between and it has to be replaced. When do we do this TPE? When the INR is more than 3, and when the liver enzymes are elevated more than 1000 and when the patient has got hepatic encephalopathy. How do we do? Five cycles of TPE on consecutive days with one plasma volume exchange during each cycle. As already told, the replacement of fluid, mostly FFP or sometimes albumin we use. Membrane filtration technology applied in critical care medicine setting is not very effective. Here you can see the membrane filtration technology. Here instead of hemodialysis cartridge, you just connect a plasma filtrate cartridge. Even it is more effective where the centrifuge technique is not available. The next quiz is the centrifuge technique which we have here and in the COVID centers and in the blood bank where you can remove one to two volumes of plasma with excellent results. The next liver supporting system is MARS. It is molecular adsorbent recirculating system. The, it uses albumin dialysis using the molecular adsorbent recirculating system. We call it as MARS. In this device, the blood is dialyzed across an albumin impregnated membrane 
against 20% albumin. Charcoal and iron ion exchange resin column in the circuit clean and regenerate the albumin dialysate. In this system, we find significant improvement in hyperbilirubinemia, coagulopathy, and encephalopathy. And this is a case of mass. This patient was admitted in Chidambaram Medical College and he became bad and he was sent to Stanley Medical College. From there, his bilirubin was more than 24 and he was sent back to our hospital and totally we have done two marks for this patient and he survived. And what is the significance of the liver function test? The magnitude of the elevation of liver enzyme and rate of decline do not affect the prognosis. Prognosis depends on serum bilirubin concentration and INR. Bilirubin level continue to increase due to intrahepatic cholestasis and INR remains prolonged despite declining ALT levels. And blood lactate is a very important prognostic factor for the patient's recovery. And the take home message in this poison is features of hepatotoxicity with inorganic phosphorus often develop 72 hours after ingestion. During this time, the patient has got only mild gastrointestinal symptoms and no other symptoms. Unless looked specifically, clinical evidence of ictress or an abnormality in the LFT can be missed and elevation of prothrombin time can be wrongly attributed to a warfarin containing rodenticide. LFT and PT should be mandatory in all cases and all rodenticide poisoning patients should be reviewed at least once with LFT in a week's time. Totally, we have treated 25 patients, 22 on plasma phenesis and 3 on molecular adsorbent recirculating system. We have lost 3 patients on plasma phenesis and 1 on MARS. Application of this treatment, this treatment modalities can also be used in acetaminophen poisoning and they used in abroad and mushroom poisoning like amantita, phalloids, herbal poisoning, and carbon tetrachloride poisoning. The next important poison is aluminum phosphate poisoning and saving lives with ECMO in rural area, making the impossible possible with cardiac support. Here again, we call this tablet as sulfos, the pellets with no specific antidote and treatment is directed towards the removal of the poison and supportive therapy. Normally, gastric lavage is given with coconut oil or liquid paraffin because it gets dispersed in water. And we give potassium permanganate, charcoal and multi-dose activated charcoal. But most of the patients go in for severe refractory cardiogenic shock for which initiation of vasopressors and inotropes at maximal doses through central venous cannula and amiodarone magnesium sulfate for ventricular tachycardia and glucose insulin potassium for cardiogenic shock is instituted. Once if the EF is less than 35%, we go in for IABP and if the EF falls below 25%, we go in for VA ECMO, which is the only choice of treatment. And we all know about ECMO now because of the COVID days. It is a temporary support of the heart and lung function by partial cardiopulmonary bypass. We have got VA ECMO, which is majority used for cardiac problem. VV ECMO, blood is pumped from venous side, then pumped back into the venous side, in respiratory failure and ARDS. Mostly for COVID-19, we use VV ECMO. And this ECMO is used for acute circulatory shock, not responding to conventional supportive therapy. During severe heart failure, Initially, we give volume therapy, then vasoactive medication and intra-iotic balloon counter pulsation. Finally, if it fails, we go in for ECMO. And this ECMO is extensively used nowadays in toxicological emergencies causing refractory cardiac dysfunction. The most common poison here is aluminum phosphate poisoning and abroad. And we have also got a couple of cases of calcium channel blocker poisoning with excellent result on ECMO and MARS. How are we going to initiate this ECMO? Refractory ventricular fibrillation with multiple defibrillatory shock are ineffective and if the ejection fraction in echocardiography is less than 25%, we have to initiate the ECMO. 
here you can feel the normal contraction of the heart and this is a ventricular fibrillation immediately after defibrillation and amid around the patient becomes normal and this is a patient on ecmo along with ecmo we also use crrt and ventilators crrt to maintain the volume and here you can see the ecmo machine in short and this is the oxygenator and this is the rotatory pump this is the hypo and hyperthermia to maintain the temperature and this is the patient on arrival with tachycardic bp60 by query ph severe acidosis that is lactic acidosis multiple defibrillation and extensive vasoactive drugs like noradrenaline followed by vasopressin adrenaline and dopamine and mean arterial pressure was not recordable after ecmo after 72 hours he has become normal with a normal heart rate and normal bp and normal lactate clearance he was on support with noradrenaline alone with the map of 80 and we tried to maintain the map for more than 60 millimeters of mercury but just removing the ecmo is not enough even in covid removing the ecmo is not enough they may have to go in for lung transplantation similarly patient have multitude of problems during post ecmo period one is acute limb ischemia because in VA ECMO, we take the peripheral femoral artery as the access cannula. So the patient has to be given perfused below the femoral artery or they go in for acute ischemia, gangrene and amputation of the limb. We have already amputated 2% in our 14 survived patients and they go in for acute kidney injury, acute liver failure and septicemia. To conclude, these cases initially were received with hypotension and severe left ventricular dysfunction. They rapidly deteriorate and land up in severe cardiogenic shock, ventricular arrhythmia and refractory lactic acidosis. Initially, they are treated with anti arrhythmic agent and multi defibrillation, then IABP followed by VA ECMO. Following decannulation of the ECMO, stopping the ECMO after recovery, owing to ischemic hepatitis and nephritis, they go in for hepatic failure and acute kidney injury and they are managed with therapeutic plasma exchange along with CRRT or slow sled and routine hemodialysis. What are all the challenges in ECMO in rural area? All super specialties. Specialists are in cosmopolitans and metropolitans. Only big corporate setups have ECMO. And cases like aluminum phosphate poisoning will not survive till they reach those kind of setup. But still our book says, teaches majority of population are in the rural area. As ECMO is still in emerging and not many are exposed to ECMO, very few consultants are aware about pros and cons of ECMO therapy. Till now we have performed 14 cases of peripheral BA ECMO for aluminum phosphate poisoning with four deaths. Thank you. Next, we go to the hair dye poisoning. Super small. This is a hair dye which is freely consumed by the Sri Lankan refugees who have been given shelter in Erod and Coimbatore district and also in Andhra. Ingestion of 100 ml of dye leads to laryngeal edema, acute renal failure and rhabdomyolysis. It is a widely used hair dye in India and it has a potent nephrotoxic cocktail containing pharopenylene diamine, propylene glycol and resorcinone. The characteristic features are severe angioneurotic edema, rhabdomyolysis, intravascular hemolysis with hemoglobinuria and acute renal failure. The patient initially they get admitted and they are normal but when we explain them within two to two hours they will go in for airway problem they never accept and once if they get it immediately you can see this patient immediately they accept so immediately this patient was, we were not able to do and immediately within few seconds because he went in for angioneurotic edema. So we went in for percutaneous tracheostomy and we saved this patient. 
so always these kind of patient when they take hair dye you have to be very careful and you should be prepared to maintain the airway further this ppd promotes calcium release and leakage of calcium ion from the smooth endoplasmic reticulum followed by continuous contraction and irreversible change in the muscle structure so this rhabdomyolysis is a common cause of renal failure and this can be treated with forced alkaline diuresis so that you can prevent the development of acute renal failure to conclude this hair dye injection is a common cause of attempted suicide in rural area which consists a number of nephrotoxic chemicals which may lead to respiratory musculoskeletal and renal manifestation at early recognition and prompt treatment can lead to reduction in the incidence of rhabdomyolysis and renal failure and next comes a challenging what we call it as uh, we decide or herbicide management of paraquat some people say some people say paraqua poisoning which is a herbicide available in granular or water soluble form in india it is available only as water soluble form 24% solution as a water soluble form it is rapidly absorbed and it gets accumulated in the lungs and kidney after absorption more than 90% of the absorbed dose is excreted by the kidney as paraqua compound within 12 to 24 hours highest concentrations are found in the kidney and lungs it also accumulates in the muscle tissue which acts as a reservoir explaining prolonged deduction of plasma or during paraqua weeks or months following ingestion most of this patient going for uh, respiratory uh, pulmonary fibrosis and they are candidate of lung transplant when we ask the people about lung transplant the physician used to say even after the lung transplant because of the uh, it acts it is in the muscle tissue as a reservoir it is grow, grow, slowly released and the lung transplant gets rejected and they are not a candidate ideal candidate for lung transplant so these are all the paraquat how we get once if you dissolve in water it is it goes in for this bluish green color normally less than 20 ml it results in moderate gastrointestinal symptom 20 to 40 ml results in death within 5 days and more than 40 ml usually results in uh, more than 1 to 5 days i know ragunandan doctor will be knowing about this extensively and the degree of systemic toxicity is governed by paraquat injection and it occurs through subcutaneous intraperitoneal intravenous injection and in the oral route it affects almost all the system in the gastrointestinal system local action nausea vomiting and diarrhea but moderately or severe poison patient may develop burning sensation soreness pain in the mouth throat and retrosternal area the abdominal pain vomiting and diarrhea often soon after ingestion here you can see ulcers in the upper ga endoscopy corrosive effect of paraquat poisoning in the mouth and in the esophagus it produces perforation with mediastinitis surgical emphysema pneumothorax pleural effusion which is associated with pleuritis frequent complications are jaundice hepatomegaly and central abdominal pain which may be secondary to pancreatitis here a patient with jaundice and normally we take ct lung in paraquat and you can get all the complications like pneumomediastinum pneumothorax interstitial edema pulmonary fibrosis and consolidation such a severe poisoning which has got a very high mortality rate coming to the kidney it produces acute tubular necrosis within 24 hours which may be oliguric or non oliguric and proximal tubular dysfunction may develop in 2 to 6 days which progresses to anuria renal dysfunction results in proteinuria microscopic hematuria glycosuria amino aciduria phosphaturia and excessive leakage of sodium coming to the lung when consumed more it produces protective blood stain cough and dyspnea occurs early due to ARDS sub consumption of substantial amount late due to pulmonary fibrosis and rarely due to pneumothorax that is mediastinitis pleural effusion and iatrogenic pulmonary edema they going for declining pvo2 with resultant central cyanosis 
due to declining gas transfer factor and vital capacity. And regarding the X-ray, already I have shown you about the CT and survivors may have restrictive type of pulmonary function. Here, a case of pulmonary edema who has consumed enormous amount of paraquay poisoning. And we did even a biopsy after the death of the patient where it shows thickening of the alveolar septa due to abundant fibrosis and areas of interstitial hemorrhage with thickened septa. And small pulmonary arteries are within the thickened alveoli and muscular hypertrophy of the tunica media along with intimal thickening. So finally, if the patients that they have got, even after their death is due to extensive pulmonary involvement, and even if they survive, they go in for severe pulmonary fibrosis. And late signs and symptoms are convulsions, which may be due to cerebral edema, precipitated by fluid overload, and coma is a common terminal event and the terminal event in, is due to cardiovascular uh, causes like uh, multiple dysarrhythmias. Finally, sinus bradycardia, hypotension, cardiac arrest, which may supervene. Chest X-ray may show massive cardiomegaly and post-mortem examination reveals toxic myocarditis. Coming to the lab detection, normally bedside urine dithionide test is used. Nowadays, for all the cases, we do urine dithionide test because they we have to know whether they have consumed this paraquay or they have consumed orthonoporosis and so on. Additional modalities like gas chromatography and radio immunoassay. This urine dithionide test, how do we do? It is a qualitative urine test and detects concentration of 1 milligram per ml. Normally, 10 ml of urine is added to 2 ml of 1% solution of sodium dithionide. In 1 N sodium hydroxide, a blue color indicates the presence of paraquay. Here you can see a normal patient, a patient with paraquay. And when you do hemodialysis or hemoperfusion, we repeat every half an hour, gradually the color goes off. But again, the next day it comes because again the paraquay poison, which comes from the muscle and the kidney, they get dissolved in the plasma with high concentration. Gas chromatography detects a level up to 1 to 2 micrograms per ml and radio immunoassay up to 0.1 microgram per ml. How are we going to manage? Appropriate supportive care, removing paraquay from gastrointestinal tract, increasing its excretion from the blood and preventing cellular damage with selected agents. How do we prevent gastrointestinal absorption? Fuller said, what they call it is this Munta name, is something what they use for facial, in the girls, ladies use for facials, is administered as 30% suspension along with magnesium sulfate to produce a catharsis. Activated charcoal may be administered 1 gram per kg up to 50 gram. Gastrointestinal decontamination should be performed as quickly as possible, owing to the rapid absorption of paraquet after oral ex exposure, this fuller's earth and activated charcoal absorbs all the poison in the stomach. Extracorporeal technique, either by chemodialysis or chemo perfusion, is recommended. It has to be done within 12 hours. Chemo perfusion is better than chemodialysis. Chemodialysis should be done for a period of 4 to 6 hours or when you use a hemoperfusion cartridge, according to the concentration or the absorption of the cartridge, you can use it between one to two hours. Daily treatment should be continued. Here you can see a patient on chemo absorption, hemoperfusion cartridge. And we have to go in modulation of inflammatory response because to prevent pulmonary fibrosis. The pulse therapy we call we use cyclophosphamide, methylprednisolone, and dexamethasone. Cyclophosphamide, 15 mg per kg per day for two days. Methylprednisone, 1 gram IV OD for three days. And dexamethasone, 8 mg IV 6 hourly for 14 days. Cyclophosphamide induced neutropenia can be treated with filtristram, 0.9 mg per 30 mg. Here is a case who fortunately survived. Most of the cases die because in India they do not consume less than 40 ml. They consume more than 1 liter. So he has survived and you can see alopecia secondary to cyclophosphamide and he became normal after one month. And anti-fibrotic agents nowadays we use. Usually we 
ट्राई फिर फिनेट्रॉन 200 मिलीग्राम टैबलेट ट्राई से डे फॉर फाइव डेज एंड ट्वाइस से डे फॉर फाइव डेज एंड वंस से डे फॉर फाइव डेज बट नाउ डेज इन कोविड इंड्यूस पल्मोनरी फाइब्रोसिस दे रेकमेंड बिकॉज़ दिस हैज बीन यूज्ड फॉर इडियोपैथिक पल्मोनरी फाइब्रोसिस दिस फिर फिनेट सॉरी फिर फिनेट्रॉन 2400 मिलीग्राम एडमिनिस्ट्रेड ओरली or nasogastric at 800 mg tid for 4 weeks this has been recommended for covid induced pulmonary fibrosis we are yet to venture and next paracord poisoning we want to treat because most of the patient die of pulmonary fibrosis and to prevent oxidation we use vitamin c vitamin e and already told this n acetylcysteine we call it as universal antidote like ratol poisoning we continue with this 20 hour dose supportive measures maintaining intravascular volume monitoring of vital signs monitoring arterial blood gases and treatment of complications to conclude despite aggressive critical care management paracoi poisoning carries a very high mortality rate and this is an extensive topic so i want to conclude with the uh, venomous uh, snake bite critical care management indian venomous snake are cobra great viper and sasquatch viper i am a student from stanley medical college i have not even seen a single case of snake bite during my career and even during my post graduate career these are called big four snakes because they are responsible for the maximum death in india now they have found this hump nose spit viper which also occurs and it is in the western ghat in kerala maharashtra maharashtra and western ghats of tamil nadu so nowadays this big five snakes causes maximum death in india the neurological signs in include mostly it affects the cranial nerve producing diplopia dysphagia bulbar palsy dyspnea limb weakness and ventilatory failure they produce airway compromise which may be secondary to altered mental status aspiration obstruction secretion and laryngospasm here i would like to show most of the victims of snake bite are farmers military people and snake charmer you can see a snake charmer who is showing a snake show in a village now he is keeping the cobra in his mouth he was bitten by this cobra immediately he takes the cobra and keeps in a bag side by where he has got so many snakes because he is no once if he falls down it will affect all the public see now you can see the snake has bitten his tongue he is not even telling his assistant he has kept inside the bag and closes the bag which contains plenty of snake immediately he was brought back to a primary health center and he was referred to our hospital he was in a semi conscious state and immediately he was intubated this is where he was bitten here what i would like to insist for the post graduates are any injury in the face any stings or bite or burns immediately you try to protect the airway immediately because once if the face and the neck swells it is very difficult to maintain an airway so immediately on the second day you can see how this has been swollen on so it may be very difficult to intubate the patient and we did percutaneous prophylactic tracheostomy because if there is inadvertent removal of the endotracheal tube it is very difficult to reintubate on the fourth day there was necrosis in the bitten area and ulcer surrounding the tissue on the seventh day the soft tissue swelling completely reduced there was demarcation of the necrosed area which was appreciated well and he was weaned off from the ventilator and he was referred to a plastic surgeon and you get fasciculations like this and it is very difficult to maintain and it is one of the cause of the airway compromise and the important neurotoxicity in a snake bite is ptosis which is the first outward manifestation of <clears throat> neurotoxicity 
Once, if the patient goes in for ptosis, immediately the emergency department should be ready because at any time he will go in for ventilatory failure and ventilatory support is needed. And he was bitten by this spectacular cobra. Coming to this cobra, cobra is one of the elapid snake. The offending toxin produces non depolarizing types of neuromuscular block. Ptosis is the first outward manifestation. So it is like, just like non depolarizing muscle relaxation given during anesthesia, like uh, pancronium, atracurium, and so on. So we have to reverse with 3 mg of neostigmin and 1.5 mg of atropin, which should be given slowly intravenously. And we repeat this dose one third every second hourly, and the dose is gradually tapered. Premature discontinuation will lead to relapse. This should be followed by simultaneous administration of ASV. Atropine has a tendency for delirium, so we may go in for neostigmine and glycopyrrolate. Neostigmine atropine combination, if it does not reverse a neuromuscular block and if the paralysis of the respiratory muscle persists, then he has to go in for ventilatory support. Indications of ventilatory support, we confirm with arterial blood gas analysis. If the PaO2 is less than 60 millimeters of mercury with the FiO2 of 60% and if the PCO2 is more than 45 millimeters of mercury with the pH less than 7.35 and absence of cough and gas reflux. Usually, ventilatory support is required for around 10 days for a lapid snake bite. We all know the snake venom is circulated in the plasma. When we do two cycles of plasma synthesis, the patient can be weaned by the ventilator early. Here you can see a lady who was bitten by a cobra snake and she was connected to the ventilator and we did plasma paresis immediately for her. Normally she has to be ventilated for a minimum of 10 days. So here we have been doing plasma paresis and the plasma is being removed because the plasma contains the snake venom. Immediately after plasma basis, she is able to open her eyes and tongue. And you can see her right upper limb, which is swollen, was bitten by the snake. Next elapid is crate. This crate has a nocturnal habit like us when we are as we are going to a nightclub. And this crate fangs are so soft, it does not produce pain, no swelling, no mark at the site of bite. So in a rural area, once if you receive a patient who are areflexic and has got fixed dilated pupil, you don't diagnose as brain death. The differential diagnosis should be the crate envenomation. See, you can see the normal long fans of a other poisonous snake and a small short spongy fan of a crate. Further, this produces axonal damage and the paralysis is predominantly presynaptic, not postsynaptic like uh, cobra. So this neostigmine atropine does not have any value for great envenomation and the recovery depends on the axonal repair. And this is the great snake. So as already told you, presynaptic neurotoxin, which is predominant, it targets the terminal axon of the neuromuscular junction, extensive damage to the axon structure, complete dissepression of the transmitter synaptic vesicle, cessation of the transmitter lead and progressive flaccid paralysis. Once if the paralysis is complete, the recovery rate is dependent only on the axonal repair and not by anti-snake venom. So we have to wait till the axonal repair is complete. And here I will show a movie. This small girl was received with a great bite. On the first day, she was areflexic with fixed dilated pupil. On the second day, slowly she is able to frown and she is able to open her eyes. Then on subsequent days, slowly she is opening her eyes and on day four, she has completely opened her eyes and she is able to put her tongue out. And on the fifth or sixth day, she is able to move her limbs slowly. And this is on the seventh day, she is on ISTPs and she is able to flex her limb. 
So on the eighth day, she is almost completely conscious. On, on day 10, she is almost normal. So here, the differential diagnosis, what we want to insist is, in a rural area, if you receive a patient with no evidence of snake bite, who are air reflexing, with fixed dilated pupil with shallow respiration, the differential diagnosis is created by immediately intubate them and it takes 10 to 12 days for them to recover. The hematological signs and symptoms, coagulopathy occurs in results viper in South Asian countries. This coagulopathy, we call it as venom induced consumption coagulopathy. Bleeding from the gum is the first outward manifestation. Suppose if there is a tinge of bleeding from the gum, immediately we should suspect coagulopathy and we should be very active in resuscitating them. But anytime they may go in for bleeding and the complication of coagulopathy. Here you can see the persistent site of bleeding from the site, hematuria, gingival bleeding, epistaxis and hemoptysis, ecchymosis, subconjunctival hemorrhages. Vitroperitoneal and intraperitoneal hemorrhage causes abdominal distension tenderness and peritonism with signs of hemorrhagic shock. Here also the bedside test, what we call it as 20 WBCT, 20 minute whole blood clotting test. Just take 5 ml of blood in a test tube, keep it. Leave undisturbed for 20 minutes in ambient temperature. Tip the vessel once. If the blood does not clot, it is hypofibrinodemia, which is a result of DIC, which occurs in viper bite. So within 30 minutes, you will know the patient has been bitten by the results viper. And the Gartha Sulwana Vidhi Mudjada Viryan Kadiko. With this results viper bite, with all the systems, critical care system you can learn. And this is a chart which normally we follow for WBCT, coagulation profile. ASV blood and blood products. Criteria for severe coagulopathy here is INR more than 3, APT 50 seconds, platelet less than 50,000 and fibrinogen 75 milligrams per deciliter. If the platelet is less than 50,000, two units of fresh frozen plasma or platelet concentrate is transfused every day till platelet count starts improving. Current trend is to start anti snake venom 60 ml for a period of 6 hours, which is followed by 20 ml 6 hourly, with 2 units of fresh blood at 12th hour interval and the coagulopathy gets corrected within 24 to 36 hours in 95% of the patient. It is assessed by repeating the 20 WBCT every 6 hours. If the patient is in AKI acute kidney injury, it has to be given during dialysis to avoid fluid overload. The advantage of transfusing whole blood takes care of the coagulopathy. Also provides adequate hemoglobin for oxygen transport. Because of the unavailability of whole fresh blood, the components are used. Heparin and antifibrinolytic agents are ineffective in snake bite. Here in ultrasound, you can see the coagulopathy. You can see the pleural effusion, but mostly it is a hemothorax and you can see the perinephric fluid, free fluid in the abdomen, all are blood, and you can see the collapsed lung in the ultrasonography. So once if we try to aspirate, it is only frank blood, and you can see frank blood compete one. The lesson what we learn, once if the patient is in coagulopathy in snake bite, please do not attempt any invasive procedure, including catheterization. We have to be very careful because you may lose the patient with hemorrhage. And here we see the echocardiogram where you can see the pericardial effusion and the left ventricular function. And you can see subarachnoid hemorrhage, intracerebral hemorrhage, and this is cavernous sinus thrombosis in the case of snake bite, right MCA infarct in both in CT and MRI. And this is the diagnosis of brain death. Normally, in nowadays, in any case in ICU, we do a MRI to see the architecture of the circle of release. If the architecture of the circle of release is lost, the patient is brain dead. If it is preserved, then he is not dead.
plasma paresis in envenomation is used as adjuvant for snake envenomation, decreases venom induced toxicity, and it relieves the complication and reduces the hospital stay. And membrane filtration technology we use in critical care setting. Already I told about plasma paresis in retol poisoning. And we use either albumin or fresh frozen plasma. Here they prefer albumin because the risk of hypersensitivity reaction and transmission of blood bond infection is less. Normally, we use unfraction heparin as anticoagulant. We use the double the dose in plasma paresis because substantial amount of infused heparin is removed along with the plasma. Normally, we use two cycles of plasma paresis. First, after six hours, following the bite two on the second day with the hypothesis that the injected snake venom is primarily absorbed by the lymphatics and later drained to the blood. The delay of six hours is for allowing time for plasma paresis procedure to access the venom in the blood. The advantages most of the time anti-snake venom dose is reduced, rapid swelling and avoids compartmental syndrome, correction of DIC, and reduces the frequency of dialysis in snake bite induced AKI, correction of snake bite induced sepsis and septic shock, reduces the patient days on ventilatory support, and overall significantly reduces morbidity and the cost of the hospital stay. Here, a patient on centrifugal technique of plasma phrasis. Acute kidney injury in snake bite is due to viper. It is either due to the direct effect of the toxin or because of hypotension. Earliest signs are oliguria and hematuria. And we do POCUS, that is point of care ultrasound in snake bite. Because within two to four hours after necrotoxic snake bite, the abdomen scan reveals poor corticomedullary differentiation, indicating acute tubular necrosis. The urea and creatinine generally raises only after 12 to 24 hours. But even before that, we can see the perinephric fluid collection which denotes early AKI. Similarly, when we do renal Doppler, the resistance index is more than 0.75. It denotes AKI, which is revealed within six hours in nephrotoxic snake bite. So before the urea and creatine raises, you can see the changes in the renal damage by ultrasonography. And we do urine routine, which shows granular cast and B range RFT. Here you can see a normal kidney with normal corticomedullary differentiation. Here the corticomedullary differentiation is lost. Here you can see the perinephric edema on both the kidneys. And this is the renal Doppler where this is high resistance. Here you can see both the systolic and diastolic wave. You can see only the systolic wave. The diastolic wave is zero. And nowadays instead of measuring central venous pressure, we all know we do regularly uh, IVC estimation every one to two hours. If the IVC size is less than 1.6 centimeter, it shows hypovolemia. If it is more than two centimeters, it shows hypervolemia. So to manage early prophylactic dialysis is indicated when there are changes in the kidney, even if the urea and creatine were found to be normal for ultimate early outcome. And if oliguria sets in, initially we go in for fusimate stress test with administration of 200 mg of flucemate at 4 ml per hour, 40 mg per hour intravenously and the urine output is monitored. If there is no adequate urine output, one more 200 mg dose is repeated. Usually the benefit occurs after 6 hours. This flucemate stress test converts the oliguric phase to diuretic phase. Similarly, to minimize the risk of renal damage from myoglobinuria and hemoglobinuria, we have to correct hypovolemia. So we see the contraction of the heart to see the contractility and also see the IBC to see the preload and accordingly we treat. Severe acidosis treated with bicarbonate. Ongoing rhabdomyolysis, sepsis, hemolysis and hypercatabolism may aggravate acidosis and hyperkalemia. We have to be very careful. If renal shutdown occurs, hemodialysis is contemplated and the femoral catheter must be the vascular access for hemodialysis in a patient who is bleeding because subclavian and internal jugular vein as vascular access may prove detrimental like this. 
So once if the patient is in coagulopathy, you have to do renal dialysis. Usually the first choice should be femoral dialysis, sorry, femoral catheter. And some patient will go in for renal cortical necrosis who suffer oliguria for more than four weeks and go in for diffuse bilateral renal cortical necrosis. It is confirmed by renal biopsy and contrast enhanced CT scan of the kidney. They require regular dialysis support and eventual renal transplantation. The hypotension and shock, hypovolemia from loss of circulating volume in swollen limb or internal and external hemorrhage, and it may be due to venom-induced vasodilatation, direct myocardial effect of the venom, cardiotoxicity with or without arrhythmias, anaphylaxis induced by antisnake venom, respiratory failure, acute pituitary adrenal failure, and septicemia. Hypovolemia is treated with IV fluid controlled by CBP, nowadays by IVC monitoring, and excess volume replacement may cause pulmonary edema. Acute pituitary adrenal insufficiency occurs in Russell's viper bite and contributes to shock. Hydrocortisone is effective in these cases. Septic shock is a challenging uh, in the management of snake bite where they go in for cis sepsis septic shock. It is very common in Russell's viper envenomation and it is challenging to treat. Here you, we can see a patient with severe septic shock and with the uh, con less contraction with intra aortic balloon pump. And gradually we see the improvement of the contraction of the heart on the first day and the contraction of the heart on the final day. And we can do wonders with intra aortic balloon pump if the ejection fraction is less than 30%. Another challenging thing is capillary leak syndrome. One of the etiology is snake bite and inflammatory mediators play a key role in this CLS. The diagnostic features are hemoconcentration, hypotension, generalized edema, and hypoalbuminemia without albuminuria. How are you going to treat? In brief, initial phase of CLS requires fluid resuscitation. So if there is volume overload, which is a second phase of CLS, it may require a diuretic or ultrafiltration, which can be done by dialysis machine. In some specific condition, colloid has been found to be superior to crystalloids. In a nutshell, early diagnosis, good supportive care, monitoring of the fluid and electrolyte status, vasopressor therapy, antibiotic, and ventilatory support are essential in the management of CLS. Here you can see the CLS in the third space. Treatment of the bitten area, which may be painful and swollen. So it should be elevated. Broad spectrum antibiotic is used to combat the infection. Metadonazole is used for anaerobic infection. Necrotic area requires sloughing of the skin and skin grafting. It's the necrotic area. Next one is the compartmental syndrome. So this compartmental syndrome can be avoided by proper plasma pheresis and irreversible muscle damage can be prevented by early administration of ASP. Local ASV can cause severe pain and increases the intra-compartmental syndrome pressure. So before, during fasciotomy, normally we never do, but if it is absolutely indicated and if the pressure is more than 40 millimeters of mercury, hemostatic abnormalities must be corrected. There should be clinical evidence of compartmental syndrome. And if the intra-compartmental pressure is more than 40 millimeters of mercury, and it can be easily measured by introducing the cannula connected to the pressure transducer or manometer. So this is fasciotomy. And tetanus prophylaxis, because tetanus organism may flourish in the fangs of the poisonous snake and in the devitalized tissue. Injecting tetanus toxin and human tetanoglobulin is effective. Analgesic for severe pain, we go in for norfotic analgesic, but used in caution in respiratory failure. In renal failure, nephrotoxic drugs are avoided. Nowadays, we use this uh, uh, patch, fentanyl patch and norcuron patch. Dexoprofoxone or paracetamol can be used in nephrotoxicity. And another challenging is necrotizing fasciitis in snake bite. Fasciitis involves a subcutaneous tissue and deep fascia. The clinical presentation may be masked as changes in overlying skin may only be observed later in the disease process. So, here a patient with necrotizing fasciitis who went in for wound debris 
and after two hours it has become completely normal within six hours the necrotizing infection becomes so bad and he goes so bad so here the confirmation of diagnosis is just an xhs of the affected part or mri where you can see the air shadows in the necrotizing soft tissue infection you can see the air shadows here this is a lethal disorder should undergo immediate surgical debridement you should do culture sensitivity and broad spectrum antibiotics that cover gram positive cocci gram negative bacilli and anaerobic should be used and this snake when i'm in pregnancy in this 30 years we have received almost five to six cases now we have got a case same dose of anti snake venom should be given we have to monitor signs of fetal distress fetal heart rate vaginal bleeding abdominal pain and ultrasound of fetal heart ultrasound has done wonders nowadays and this lady has been the bitten side is the left leg and the culprit is the Russell's viper. Rehabilitation is a neglected part. Restoration of the normal function, conventional physiotherapy for severe local envenomation. And the take home message here is anti snake venom is indicated in venomous snake bite. Remember, it has got its own side effect. Neosegment and glycopyrrolate are atropine to neutralize the non depolarizing muscle relaxant in cobra bite. Great envenomation is mostly presynaptic, and if axonal damage occurs, anti stenic venom is of no use. Mechanical ventilation in ventilatory failure in elapid snake bite. RRT in viper envenomation. Fresh whole blood or blood products for coagulopathy. Identifying early sepsis and early goal directed therapy in sepsis and plasma versus to reduce the complication. And to conclude, the indispensable successful teams. Today, each of us will give our best. Respect will permeate from all of us. Unstoppable patient will guide us. Steadfast unity will hold up and help us through the challenges. Together we can and will keep winning. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for the wonderful presentation. Thanks. The take home message was succinct and excellent, sir. Thank you very much again. It looked like uh, attending my classes again as a postgraduate student. Wonderful, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And now I request Dr. Shanti Miller, madam, to give her inputs. Madam? Shanti Malar, madam. Please unmute yourself, madam. Shanti Malar, madam. So good evening. Am I audible? Good evening, madam. Yes, am I audible? Hello. I will know, madam. Hello. Yes, madam. Is it audible? Sir, not able to hear. It is audible, sir. Uh, Ganapati, sir, you please close your share, sir. Share screen can be closed now. The share screen can yes, be closed. Sir. Slide share screen can be closed, please. Yes, sir. Have to pick up that stop, uh, stop share, sir. Yeah. Okay. Please go yeah. to the next and then close, sir. Stop, sir. Okay. Okay, man. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Yes, madam. Sure. Yes, madam. Yes. Please start, madam. Sir. Good evening. 
sir from ganapati sir thank you very much for yes, your sir. extraordinary studies for almost four decades you have done a good job for the societal emergency health needs it's not so easy in a small rural setup at 1983 so starting in 1983 so such a wonderful job you have done and uh, very happy that i am also part of uh, stanley at the i did my diploma in uh, anesthesia in stanley also and as you said it's a poison actually uh, uh, almost or poisons and medicines are often times the same substance given with a different intent even small quantity can damage and can lead to death actually it's like a chemical monkey wrench so you have covered almost almost all the toxicology topics like uh, organophosphorus and paraquat iodide and aluminum phosphate most common now it is as you said it's most commonly uh, misused aluminum phosphate yes. and um, regarding this venom um, snake venom cynic it's only the mostly in the rural setter because you are not seen in stanley even during my study uh two year study uh, diploma i have not seen a snake bite uh, in uh, stanley uh, yes. study or uh, this um, main thing is how do you uh, for example uh, create awareness on that uh, actually information education should create awareness among the public especially the rural setup how to prevent prevent the aspect then how we are going to bring early as early as possible to the uh, healthcare system maybe in private setup or government setup your ideas yes, yes. actually uh, initially uh, some 10 years back we used to have a separate ambulance and uh, we used to go to all the villages and tell the panchayat fellows yes, and sir. we show movies show movies show the movies there and before the movies for the cloud first we will put this uh, uh, senthil kaudamani uh, and rajinikanth movies then you get the crowd and uh, we show all the movies to them and also in the local channels is it audible sir in the local channels yes. we used to send uh, we have we, we used to spread this news but yes, nowadays we have, got, we have got this whatsapp madam which yes, is sir. very effective very effective whatsapp is very effective and we have got uh, so many uh, classes in whatsapp and we uh, once if the patient attender come we show all the things in the uh, whatsapp outside in our cl clinic and also we share it in the in our website and also we used to send in whatsapp with the the patient attenders so is it it is very easily reachable and of course it is i started from 1986 almost uh, 36 years and now it, uh, my name is very familiar they say ganapati hospital and from four districts wherever you have got uh, snake bites and poison they say uh, karangalpalli and ganapati hospital pambadi hospital they come even now see while talking i have received two cases which i have not seen my assistant would have seen so like that uh, it spreads by mouth and also the results madam if you show results automatically it come and you know we were in stanley i was trained and dr uh, professor t srinivasan also dr raghavalo we all work uh, 18 hours a day in critical care unit and it is a patient even now i wait i work 16 to 18 hours a day if you put a patient on aluminum phosphate poisoning we never sleep for 2 to 3 days unless uh, the consultant is there you lose the patient in aluminum phosphate poisoning yes, on sir. it is uh, just a dedication and commitment madam this is how yes, we we spread throughout the villages yes sir so thank you very much for that but uh, the for example in villages it's a snake bite it is inevitable some of because in the field uh, the very poor people are working in the fields it's very difficult to prevent that aspect but only the patients will come with the snake bite but the other things uh, mostly a poison uh, by the attitude by the public that self form attitude so that how we are going to prevent that in the self form attitude like um, tablet or um, aluminum phosphate or uh, organophosphorus paraquat or yeah they whatever it is it's mostly of cell form compared to your snake bite uh, so how we are going to create awareness among the public to prevent this this is stress nowadays especially in the 2020 and 2021 it's almost like a stress induced um, new normal we are living in a new normal due to covid pandemic uh, to reduce the stress how we are going to do this for this sake toxicology aspect 
and um, i really are doing good job sir actually i bow to you actually uh, this aspect of not only for the public for the uh, the students elkar work even the elkar service providers are affected due to the stress heavy workload on the, this is a different uh, workload actually so well, you are uh, ideas for that your suggestions for that yes ma'am regarding suggestion only the, that is uh, we have to go to the community level madam yes sir and uh, we have to do to the community level and mm -hmm. it should, it, we should form an organization then yes, we yes. have to sort out some protocols then we yes. have to do that but uh, what you say is uh, mine is mostly clinical uh, although i got a college of nursing also and mm -hmm. in the community people i asked them to go and say but this should be separately we should form a department and we have to do but uh, i don't think with my strain of this work i cannot be do i cannot do preventive job madam uh, no I sir just... no i am sorry to interrupt actually i am not asking you to do so your suggestions how to improve because everybody as a healthcare service providers it is our job to involve all the categories of people all the cadres of the healthcare service providers for the uh, this to prevent this stress as such to prevent this self harm first point second point is uh, except the snake bite or some insect bite whatever it is that's why i asked for your suggestions then uh, regarding the stress almost all the uh, our uh, medical college hospital they have psychiatric department psychologist everybody is contributing their effort and even uh, during our clinical uh, even i am also an anesthesiologist as an anesthesiologist i say we are most oriented to the clinical aspect but now we have to concentrate little more for the uh, mental aspect also so i cause yes. caring of the patient not only the patient the patient relatives during the intensive care treatment of the patient all these things that ideas can be shared uh, for that only i asked thank you very much sir okay i have i have a suggestion madam that if some yes, uh, a good poster can be made for a minimal requirement which can be pasted in all the wellness centers and phcs of the state it will be a yes, good sir. eec material if you yes, seniors sir. can sit together and formulate some uh, 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 a single poster which can be pasted in all the phcs it will do human wonders so yes we are uh, doing uh, not only the posters uh, already we are uh, taking classes in batches for staffs and uh, post graduates and crris like that for psychological aspects also we are covering like during orientation like in our emergency department uh, we we are uh, managing all sars sars a lot of uh, toxicology patients also manage here and uh, whatever available with available resources and uh, with available resources like hr and equipment and uh, consumables we are trying our best but um, still a uh, long way to go we have further we have to improve and uh, as a university vc madam has to support a lot of uh, so for research studies also i request vc madam for that also thank you very much sir I, uh, thank you very much madam may can i now request dr ragunathan ragunandan for his comment sir please sir deputy thank you sir uh, uh, for your excellent presentation and uh, actually before i make my comment i request sir to touch on two important i think for want of time you would have missed it one is chani powder because uh, chani powder uh, erode is authority and paimuttur so i was eagerly waiting that you will touch because that's a very unique poison being uh, taken only in the people in and around that district uh, so i would like to hear from that a few minutes i know uh, i mean you can even talk without slides also no i can easily talk because so, sorry sir one more thing the green green powder also something they used to say gokumarande gokumarande uh, that also sir thank you <laughs> sir it is as you said it is an extensive topic when i saw it was only 20 minutes then i asked vc madam she said you are the only speaker you can uh, you also requested her because sir uh, i revised this for four or five times it was actually some 280 slides for this two four topics excellent topic everything is a separate topic which we used to present so that is a main lag anyway i will tell this sani powder they produce severe electrolyte imbalance sir. they produce severe electrolyte imbalance they go in for hyperkalemia and uh, acidosis okay and once if you start correcting and the sani powder in the erode area it is good but 
the sani powder the point flour area and the gobi chetti palayam area they even uh, dilute this uh, copper sulfate copper sulfate also they dilute so it has to be managed like uh, that temperature and all those things has to be managed la sani powder enna panna ventricular so for ventricular fibrillation and all what we use is we used to give this amiodarone and magnesium sulfate i will send you the details because i don't remember the dose but once if we correct the electrolyte imbalance early we are able to save the patient sir what will be the common clinical presentation sir when we take because i see that they may have seizures one and of course uh, hepatotoxicity also that's what i heard from because when we take classes for nurses from that area they used to tell suppose seizures varumbode seizureodu vandale we know it has got high mortality something like that they used to say so what 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 could be the clinical presentation sir sir mostly in the initial stage they don't get but after 2 to 3 years they do get and these seizures are secondary to cerebral hypoxia due to irregular contraction of the heart once if we receive with seizures here once if we receive we immediately connect them to the ventilator and we correct the ventricular arrhythmias they become all right sir but if they come late or for example uh, we have got satyam mangalam which is around 1 and 1/2 hours from euro they just walk and uh, sit in the ambulance and they are brought dead here in the middle they get two or three seizures if they if we get them alive we are able to save them and what we because we, all in the periphery they don't have this uh, highly uh, equipped uh, lab services uh, to be frank nowadays uh, this il6 and all uh, we have been using for snake bites for septicemia after covid within 15 minutes we get uh, the value of il6 d dimer everything like that we have got the lab facilities it's an advantage so immediately uh, the abg we are able to see they go in for severe acidosis and uh, hyperkalemia sir if we correct them they become all right they these things are secondary to gross electrolyte imbalance and as you all know uh, suppose in the poison all the given all the people physicians is the ones they say if they receive a poison case if they go in for uh, fits and epilepsy they go in directly they go in for uh, anti epileptics but even arrhythmia but we have been taught if the patient has gone in for uh, uh, arrhythmias and uh, fits in poison case you can first correct the electrolyte imbalance the patient will become all right so these are all the points sir so once you get definitely they become all right your experience on this emerging voices like growth promoters today we are seeing a lot of apart from the i mean opc and old things uh, carbamates organochlorine now people are indulging in this growth promoting uh, substances which are not too toxic i believe so what is your experience in erod sir huh? we don't get patients sir grow can you tell me the name we don't get growth promoters here now mostly we oh, get uh, yes. aluminum phosphide and ratol we don't okay. get uh, growth okay sir i'll share our experience sir as far as uh, ratol paste is concerned it is really uh, emerging and uh, we are seeing lot of in fact last one week we saw 10 patients in one yes, sir, day i do that i do that yeah. so the, that too all are young girls between 16 to 20 and many of them they may not know the seriousness of this uh, poison just something like a paste what you are for that little amount they just take it and even they don't reveal to the parents or their friends or relatives in fact we used to get patients from medical gastroenterology op because they would have taken some small quantity without telling and slowly they develop jaundice so once they get jaundice they go to the medicine then from there they go to mge so when they take a proper history of the case then they will indulge that they have taken some at all pace then the patient comes late also sometimes as you rightly said it needs especially when the ratol pace is highly fatal and if the quantity is uh, even a little bit more than the normal thing what we are talking it can be highly fatal and you rightly pointed out about the uh, supportive care plasma pharesis and other things but ultimately the renal transplant liver transplant would be the ideal choice in case the liver is very very much <coughs> damaged that is one thing sir similarly regarding the other one is thing regarding counseling uh, madam was also uh, talking about primary prevention of, of course primary pre- prevention we can have a helpline like in chennai and all we have a helpline called sneha so if somebody has got a suicidal tendencies they can just call up this number and get some 
telephonic counseling that services is available in chennai but uh, one thing what we do in our hospital in, in our poison center is uh, we do counseling at the time of discharge so that they should not indulge in again poisoning suppose they have attempted one attempt of uh, suicide they should not repeat it again later because the family situation other things would be the same when they go back so we do have a follow up op also we ask them to at least come for follow up for one or two months so every thursday we run a follow up clinic for this uh, people and of course we get the psychiatric uh, opinion before they get discharged and uh, another thing is uh, uh, what we saw is another uh, unique poison is the car trap that is also number of cases we have seen a little bit uh, recently on the type of, apart from our routine uh, opc poisoning this chemical called car trap is also being the thing and of course i want your opinion on use of uh, plants those days we used to see a lot of uh, oleander and all those things are you seeing are you still seeing that or it's gone now no we, we see sir even now we have got a case of oleander seed poisoning we get oleander seed poisoning and uh, woodwind poisoning we get which is very woodwind poisoning which produces severe hypokalemia and acidosis <laughs> uh, we get but that, that is a bit rare now but we get uh, oleander seed poisoning in a crushed form so symptomatically we treat and they do well with the prophylactic transmenous uh, pacemaker cell. We are able to save them. Only in that Incidentally, in, uh, maybe two years back, we had one interesting cases from Tiruvannamalai. It was well reported in the press and also because uh, they were using this paste, the rattle paste for homicide. For homicide also, they tried to mix it slowly and give it to the family members like that. So we had a series of cases, unexplained death in Tiruvannamalai. Then we probed and finally we found it was uh, one fellow was using a uh, rattle paste as a homicide uh, also. Anyway, it's a very, very nice to listen to you again, sir. Again, for the benefit no. of listeners, sir, sir, I have been there to sir center a couple of times. He's doing an excellent work and uh, we should appreciate even though he say it's a rural setup he got all the gadgets and tech, i mean instruments and uh, therapeutic interventions and uh, again i wish him all the best and he will continue to do good works thank you very much sir thank you sir. thank you, thank you sir. sir wonderful sir can i have uh, dr uh, captain ragavelu sir opinion please captain ragavelu please yes sir Dr. Raghavelu, I can see a hand popping there. Uh, Dr. Raghavelu, sir. In the meantime, is Dr. Ram Kumar available? Dr. Ram Kumar. Dr. Ram Kumar, you can unmute and you can talk. You unmute and talk. Raghavelu, sir, you can also unmute and talk. Am I audible now, sir? Yes, yes. Yes, you are audible. Ram Kumar. Yes, yes, Dr. Ram Kumar, please. Go ahead, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you for your uh, excellent presentation. And uh, your job is very commendable that you have taken the hospital care in the Eero district to a very higher, greater extent since you are uh, doing ECMO and other uh, treatment modalities also. And as a nephrologist, uh, I would just like to give the basic points regarding what to choose, whether it is hemodialysis for a specific poison or whether it is hemoperfusion or whether it is uh, plasma paresis. The basic points based on which you can choose either of these modalities will be based on the molecular weight of the poison or the drug that the patient has consumed and what is the degree of the protein binding of the drug and what is the volume of distribution of the drug or the poison and the fourth point would be based on the endogenous clearance of the drug or the poison which means whether uh, the kidney and the liver is active in the patient or not if patient has got renal failure or hepatic failure the metabolization of the poison or the drug may get delayed so the endogenous clearance of the drug or the poison will be delayed hence the renal replacement therapy may be effective in these patients 
based on the molecular weight, hemodialysis will remove any drug or poison which is water soluble, which has got a very low molecular weight, say around less than 5,000 Daldens. Uh, in these patients, hemodialysis can be effective if it is water soluble and if the molecular weight is low. If the drug or the poison has got a very extensive protein binding, then probably we will have to consider either plasmapheresis or a hemoperfusion. Hemoperfusion, as Sir said, works based on the adsorbent technology. And uh, plasmapheresis, as we all know, it removes the plasma as well as the proteins which are present in the plasma. And with regard to the volume of distribution, if the volume of distribution is very less, single session or uh, two or three sessions of renal replacement therapy would be fine because the volume of distribution, what we mean is where, where are the places the drug has gone and deposited in the body. If it is just remaining in the blood, one or two sessions of renal replacement therapy can effectively remove the drug or the poison. But if the drug is extensively deposited in various tissues and once you remove the drug from the blood and if there is going to be a redistribution of the poison or the drug from the tissues where it is deposited again back to the blood, then we need repeated sessions of renal replacement therapy, whether it is plasma paralysis or hemodialysis or hemoperfusion. So these are the basic points based on which we decide what to choose, whether it is hemodialysis or hemoperfusion or plasma paralysis. And again, we need to know what are the complications that can happen based on the uh, type of renal replacement therapy because the renal replacement therapy, again, does not go without any side effects. There can be some problems that are associated with renal replacement therapy, and we need to uh, proceed with the management, or we need to be carefully, or we need to be aware of what are the complications that can happen because of the renal replacement therapy also. That is it, sir. Thank you, Dr. Ram. Sir, can I talk now? Yes, sir. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm very happy. Uh, Dr. Ganapati has done an extensive work, and but uh, that too, particularly in the rural setup, uh, I admire his work because in Stanley, it's a well-known center for uh, toxicology in those days, even now, and uh, as he said. We have not seen a snake bite in Stanley. No, before I have, I am gifted with that. I had a case in Stanley that is after the Ganabadi left and before Shantimular came in, in that period. So that was one incident, but we successfully weaned off the patient and sent back to IMCU to Dr. Rajinikant. So that is a different thing. I appreciate Dr. Ganabadi starting from that golden days and keeping pace with the modern uh, development. See, that is the most important thing, is keeping pace with the knowledge and the newer, acquiring a newer te technology uh, to support his uh, uh, treatment. So that is a very good um, uh, treatment plan because you name the latest equipment available in the city of Madras, it is available in Erode in his center before that. See, that is the attitude, is passion towards treatment towards the profession towards the medicine see that is the one which keeps and i <laughs> appreciate if uh, this sort of uh, uh, centers come around at least one in one uh, come not is divided into four zone at least one in four <clears throat> one zone second thing is creating an awareness uh, about this what are the ways you we can as we do the bls work in uh, can see, uh, work in uh, schools and colleges and uh, various places we can also organize lecture programs by using healthcare professionals in schools, colleges, and uh, workplaces so that the better awareness is created. We can also make a film uh, and uh, show it in the, the, um, the theaters also. Sometimes the awareness will be better because, as Raghunandan said, in those days, we I used to see cases of copper sulfate poisoning just for an ass. 25 paise worth of um, copper sulfate they use and consume. 
and very good muscular young boys used to die in front of our eyes because of the bleeding and hypoxia because of uh, extensive pulmonary edema so like that is a poor enough worth causing so much of damage so the awareness created is, is a most more important particularly in the schools and colleges and uh, workplaces so that is one aspect and uh, uh, one thing to be appreciated ganapati as a student as a md post grad student he used to go and discuss and convince the cardiologist in stanley hospital about certain things he is maintaining the same thing even now he is uh, way of uh, then, uh, <coughs> delivery so it is so crystal clear for the others to understand easily there is no bombarding languages bombarding equations bombarding uh, uh, <coughs> dialogues which makes the recipient more uh, Uh, uncomfortable is uh, words of uh, this thing is very very simple uh, easily understandable that is a very good uh, uh, gift dr ganavedi has got and uh, uh, there is nothing more to add because he has covered almost all the latest treatment modalities for the poisoning but he has not covered the entire gamut of poisoning because of the limitation of time and uh, i think uh, given more time we could have had thank you very much um, madam sudha sheshian and all the panelists for a very good interesting evening today thank you very much thank you very much sir thank you very much for your insight would anybody else like to add anything on what has happened now sir uh, ganapati uh, sir thank you very much for your extraordinary contribution towards uh, societal needs and uh, the i as uh, dr aragwali say said uh, the script okay. in your uh, still it exists i want i so pray it's not for audible then sir am i audible uh, a little louder yeah you are audible ma'am you are audible a little louder yeah thank you uh, this is uh, thank you very much sir ganapati sir for your extraordinary yes. contribution towards the societal health needs second is um, most of the thing is because of this you are uh, compassion towards the job you are uh, service oriented profession towards the patient and their relatives at the right attitude right uh, needs for the right needs of the patients you are doing wonderful job sir thank you um, very much for this opportunity given to me also ragu i thank, thank you very much and vc ma'am thank you very much sir. madam i shall convey dr ragunathan sir wanted to say something please sir so uh, regarding the paracor i think uh, we have to convince the government to ban or some regulated supply because even as yes, you rightly said even 10 to 20 more than 20 ml is almost fatal yes. now so many of them they do not know that by taking that they think it is only to threaten the family or something like that and uh, later after few days uh, really want to live and be they die in front of eyes so if you can pull the data of paracor and we have to do something to gather to convince the concerned authorities even to add some regulator or if possible to ban the paracor thank you sir even thank aluminum you. phosphide across the counter they are getting but actually aluminum Almost. phosphide I, aluminum phosphide is it very common sir in iron and other side because yes. in chennai yes. we don't see that much uh, chennai i am talking not only chennai neighboring districts like tiruvallur kanjivaram we don't see aluminum phosphide but uh, i do see a lot of from northern states they for them uh, ratol i mean uh, road incitement it's mostly uh, well, especially chandigarh like, and all it's very yeah, common yeah, that's what but but is it common in your neighboring in the you district sir tennamarathu tennamarathu ku veppanga sir eli ki tennamarathu la keel veppanga corona corona marathu solringa corona corona marathu nu solvanga corona marathu is you met that is for it ஒரு <laughs> 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 we need to educate the public a little more on these common terminologies sir there is a opportunity whenever it presents 
if the list of all the uh, 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 material which should not be used or which are dangerous can just be put in one single uh, place for everybody to see, it may do a, a great service in the, the prevention part that all of you have been talking about. Would anybody else like to add anything today, sir? Otherwise, we have had an extraordinary lecture from Dr. Ganapati today. Thank you very much. Next week itself, we have the next. We have the next webinar in the next week itself. Dr. V. Mohan will be the uh, speaker on 13-8, sir. Dr. Ganapati, sir, has been an outstanding uh, participant from the inception of the webinar, sir. Uh, Thank you, sir. Uh, and it's been a pleasure having you here today, along with your full set of uh, uh, critical care uh, team here. And I hope all the members who have listened here will be the ambassadors to whatever you have told. Thank you very much for joining with us today, sir. Thank you again, all of you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Shall we leave the meeting? Thank you, yes, sir. sir. Thank you.